भगवते वासुदेवाया so tonight um we have a little bit of a possibly for some people an unusual topic on uh the nature of attachment and and renunciation and what spurred this topic and a lot of people might be able to relate to this um was a question that i i got um from our online audience where somebody is um they they wrote sometimes i see the spiritual idea of detachment used as an excuse to run away from re- responsibilities to abandon relationships all different types or to emotionally disengage in negative and often disastrous ways i've seen a lot of harm done in the name of detachment what is real detachment as spoken of in the bhagavad gita and the vedic teachings and how is it correctly utilized in a healthy spiritual life um is quite quite an interesting question firstly i i think we just got to d- deal with one one point the claim to be following a spiritual process or adopting a more spiritual kind of life by a person doesn't necessarily make it spiritual we you know 20 years ago you talk about yoga and it was kind of like some really esoteric thing hardly anybody knew what it was they had some sort of limited very limited idea but now it's become so widespread the introduction of, of hatha yoga asana practice and with it came a lot of other trappings and things that were connected to deeper spiritual practices and what we're seeing though unfortunately is a lot of people are practicing spiritual things that actually are disconnected from um authentic spiritual teaching there is a tendency of people on the basis of some sentiment and because they like some sort of idea to sort of adopt that superficially or externally and then think that because of adopting some external thing that that makes their life and what they're doing spiritual and that's not a very mature understanding along with that comes you know people just picking up bits and pieces of of ideas whether it's in buddhism or or um in in the broader yoga principles or or any other um form or spiritual path uh picking up some of those things but applying them in a very selfish way and what i mean by selfish i mean in a, in a very self-centered way so for instance this idea people have heard that okay um being spiritual means not being attached we need to reduce attachments even to become very renounced about things uh material things and they they take that concept or idea and then they use it to manipulate others for instance if i got involved with another person and i'm in some form of relationship with them then i decide to move on i could use the pretext of 
wanting to be more renounced or wanting to uh, give up attachments um, as an excuse for for abandoning uh, another person or a responsibility. It can be not just in relation to relationships, but other types of things to just abandon and walk away from stuff because I want to do something else that's no longer holding my attention. It's no longer making me so-called happy. It's not doing it for me. It's not turning me on. So I, I, I want to just walk away from it. And I do it in the guise of, of being renounced, of giving up attachments. And in a similar manner, I mean, I asked this person for more specific examples. And, you know, some of the examples that were given were, were still not very clear. But I've seen it myself in situations where people have come to me and spoken to me about, you know, the idea of, of um, a person, getting a bit personal here, a person, you know, perhaps being involved in a relationship and then wandering off and having a spur of the moment um, sexual uh, relationship with another person. And then when the person that meant to be in a committed relationship with objects, the person who has wandered off and done this now starts assuming the position of, of teacher or guru almost and the lecturing that person uh, your problem is that you're just overly attached and the, the attachment is not good and it's just like what <laughs> you know that's utterly self-serving that has nothing to do with spiritual life it is nothing to do with real um, spirituality what whatsoever so I, I can really understand where this person's sort of coming from when they ask the question, because I myself have seen it on, on numerous occasions and, and um, had to try and you know, help people through some of this kind of, of difficulty. So uh, f firstly, I, I think it's really important to understand what the principles are are dealing with the principles of renunciation, the principles of, of not being attached to things, and why, why that is problematic. Um, it, it states in the Bhagavad Gita that there are principles to regulate attachment and aversion pertaining to the senses and the objects of the senses. So just try to grasp that one for a moment, the sense of sight, smell, taste, all these things. And then there are objects that those senses want to dwell on to try and, and enjoy. So there are principles to regulate attachment and aversion. Attachment and aversion were considered um, opposite sides to the same coin. So in, in relation to the example I gave earlier, where somebody decides they're no longer interested in being in a particular relationship with someone, there is an immediate abandonment of any sense of duty or responsibility and one is just driven by, you know, the, their self-centered position where they now think, yeah, I'm not into this anymore. This is the aversion thing. And so what they want to do is flee from that under the guise of giving up attachments or becoming renounced. But there is no difference between that when somebody renounces something on the basis of their aversion to it, there is no difference between that and being attached to material experiences, to the material world. Um, it, it, it's both uh, the same problem. 
one should not come under the control of such attachment and aversion because they are stumbling blocks on the path of self-realization. Stumbling blocks on the path of self-realization. What is self-realization? It is the realization, the awakening to the experience of being able to not only just perceive, but to completely experience my actual spiritual being, how I am actually not this body, I am not this mind. These are temporary coverings. Self-realization means to come to the awakening of this reality, to see that clearly. And so why are these other things stumbling blocks? Because attachments and aversions that uh, we may have in this world or to things connected to this world are based on the false idea that this body I have on is me and the mind which also covers me, the subtle body, is telling me, oh, do this. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, we don't like that. Yuck, that's not nice. Oh, we want this. That's all just living out a lie, a false idea that the material covering is the self. And so to be absorbed in the idea of attachment and aversion, it actually requires that we are immersed in a material state of consciousness, meaning that we perceive or we consider the material covering to be the self. And so the the spiritual ideal that the yogis um, sought to achieve or to attain was to learn to live in this world and not be profoundly affected by it in terms of feeling deep attachments or aversions. So in another verse from the Bhagavad Gita, it states that one who is unattached to the fruits of his own work. So I'll just speak to that point before we go further. Everybody is motivated to do things because they want to enjoy some result or to avoid something happening to them. And so these are always considered the fruits of one's endeavor. Spiritual life doesn't mean that you no longer act, but you act with spiritual understanding. And because of that, one must learn not to be unduly attached to the fruits of one's work, one's labor, one's activity. So one who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obliged is in the renounced order of life. And he is the true mystic, not he who lights no fire and performs no duty. So this is an astonishing um, verse because part of the ancient Vedic culture was that people divided um, life into four what they called ashramas or spiritual orders. The first was brahmacharya, um, which means to live as a student, to observe celibacy, which means that it is not only sexual activity that one refrained from in that state, but all types of just aggressive pursuit of material or sensual stimulation and enjoyment. The next spiritual order was called Grihasta, where one can live um, in a committed relationship with a, with a partner, husband, wife, and to live a fully spiritually directed life, even within the, this relationship, this connection, and to do it in a way that produced a spiritual outcome. Then they had what was called Vanaprastha, 
in Vanaprastha life, one, and it was usually in the age of about 50 to 60 years of age, one retired from actively working and supporting family and things, and now lived a fully spiritually directed life in preparation for their impending death, death being the, the end of the road. You know, when we're born, it ends with a death, the actual leaving of the body. And so one became very focused on that. And then the fourth order was called sannyasa. And sannyas, or to be a complete renunciate, it didn't mean you had to go through all these stages. One may uh, adopt this um, from, a, from a reasonably early age, or one may do it, you know, having retired from everything else. And a sannyasi took a perpetual vow of, of celibacy and renunciation. And some of the characteristics were that they did not engage in conventional um, activity or responsibility. They, they often traveled um, and they were con it was considered that they had no specific duty to perform. Unlike a person that was a brahmachari or a person that was a householder, a grihasta, there was a clear idea of what my duty was towards um, the ashram or the order in which I lived um, to the, my community, the people around me, my spiritual superiors. There was always this deep sense of duty. And one acted as, as a, out of a sense of duty rather than whether it supposedly pleases me or doesn't please me, and then I just abandon things. So in, in this particular verse that we've read, um, Lord Krishna is pointing out what a real sannyasi, a tyagi, one who has truly renounced what it means. doesn't mean one who has just given up um, uh, some of the duties attached, like lighting no fire, means uh, it was an a important part of, of Vedic society that people would engage in what was called yagya. Or, or the performance of sacrifice and sacrificial offering. It was the recognition of something greater than myself, uh, cultured a sense of gratitude, and it gave me a sense of where I fit within the world, that I am not supreme, I am not the Lord of everything, and that I do have a, a duty towards others, and that there is some higher objective or purpose in, in life. So as part of that, they would perform these, these um, this Agni Hotra, um, this Yagya, where there would be the perf regular performance of, of sacrificial offering um, that was undertaken. And it generally involved um, the ritual performance of, of lighting a sacrificial fire and making oblations into that fire with the chant swaha. So here it says that one who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obliged is in the renounced order of life and he is the true mystic, not he who lights no fire and performs no duty. So you know, these were, this is so clear. Things have to go beyond the external, that I simply externally comply with something. There has to be this big internal shift for one to grow spiritually. And it becomes, oh, it comes about as I become increasingly aware of my own spiritual identity, but accepting that I am embodied and because I have this body on, there is a duty attached to that. There is responsibility attached to that. And I live a very spiritually directed life without 
giving up things that I should do out of some whim or because I have some desire for something else or because I find it distasteful. So there is the shift away from being very self-centered and selfish to living a life that is far more balanced and purposeful and it produces a greater sense of well-being and actual happiness. And of course, there are these warnings about the nature, what happens when you become attached to things of this world. And a whole process was laid out um, to Arjuna in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And it describes this process while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. So uh, this is uh, advertisers understand this perfectly well. They know that if they can catch your attention and dangle something before you, a concept, a product, whatever, before you, and they can do it often enough in a way that is pleasing to you, you will develop an attachment for that product or experience. And you will be compelled eventually to want to try and, and enjoy it, which means purchasing it from it. That's the whole drive or the principle to, to advertising and online marketing and, and whatever. <clears throat> So by contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. And from such attachment, lust develops. So the reference to lust here is not, uh, you know, this as many people think of lust in relation to only the a sexual type act. And that is one part of it. But this actual lust is an intense self-centeredness, this desire to um, have something to experience in a, in a very intense way. So this is always the result of an attachment. When the attachment begins to grow and there is this constant contemplation upon it, it will eventually turn into a quite intense desire, which is categorized as lust. And from that lust, anger arises. So anytime that you see the manifestation of anger, it is generally due to this process. And of course, it goes on to state that from anger, complete delusion arises. I mean, you know, anger meaning when you lose control and you're just acting purely on emotion, and sometimes fearfulness or aggressiveness. It can manifest in so many different ways. So one completely loses the plot when anger takes over. And from delusion, bewilderment of memory, when memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. When intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. So, you know, this was the nature of of attachment and what was wrong with it. But aversion produces a similar type of result. So the the concept of, of attachment and the concept of renunciation, one was encouraged not to consider it in a superficial way, but in a far deeper and more meaningful way. And understanding that my development of a desire for something can easily also turn into later an aversion. In fact, this is what happens. I mean, it's astonishing that more than half of all marriages, and at least in the Western world, and now it's becoming more pervasive in the, in the older cultures, more than half of marriages end in divorce. They start with, you know, there's another verse in the Bhagavad Gita, that which in the beginning tastes like nectar and in the end becomes like poison. They speak of a type of happiness that's born of contact between the senses and the object, the desires of the senses. 
So, you know, you see this happen, that, that something can be so sweet and it's, it's just heavenly and it's just going to be fantastic and happily ever after. And it can quickly descend or over a period of time descend into a total aversion. So the need to be able to be more mature and to be not so selfishly driven to have more compassion, to have more purpose in one's life was, was absolutely essential and important. And if a person is misusing or using, you know, these ideas of, of attachment and, and renunciation that they've sort of like just picked up casually from spiritual teachings and trying to utilize that just for their own personal benefit um, to a, a cause pain to others or to use others. This has nothing to do with real spirituality. It has just the opposite. Even though a person may be, you know, proclaiming that they're very spiritually developed, if you're living out this um this way, no, that is not the case at all. Okay, thank you very, very much for the opportunity to address you. And of course, we know that the thing that will bring about the self-realization, that will make it so that we can see these things with um, much more clarity, are going to be um, brought about by meditation upon transcendental sound. So I'll ask you to, to join me in a um, kirtan. <clears throat> the mantra that we will use is, is Om Hari Om.
Haribol.